WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. And good afternoon. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. I'm Dr. Michael Crone. And I'm Dr. Mike Hargon. Back to you after a, a little short break of sort. Uh, I think we had a recorded show or a, a repeat show, but... Uh, so, Mike, you got to let us know. Uh, you're, you're, you're traveling across the uh, cross country, and you were up to Alaska. Well, where are you now? I am in uh, Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Washington. That's uh, now, get, for those of us who haven't been, you know, west of Mississippi. Uh, give us some kind of idea of where that is and what that is like. What's it known for? Um. Well, Spokane, Washington is near the boundary of Idaho. So for those, for many people, they think of Washington and they think of all the Puget Sound and the areas like that. This is actually sunny, has a real winter. Uh, it's it's where, where I went and got my undergrad. I am a Whitworth College alumni. Um, and right now it is hot. It is 90 degrees. And I just flew here last night from um, St. Paul Island, Alaska, where the whole time I was there probably never got up to 55. So I, I'm, I'm outside because it's the easiest place to do the uh, <laughs> the show on the phone, but it's uh, it's tough getting used to it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what, the 90-degree weather? Yep. <laughs> so how far are you from the Pacific Coast? From the Pacific Coast? Um, well, from the Puget Sound, it's um, based on the exit numbers of the freeway, about 250 to 300 miles. Um, oh, okay. Now, the Puget Sound is an inlet from the ocean. It's not the actual coast. I think to get to the coast, it would be another 50 um, or so uh, air miles. To get there by car, you probably have to drive, I would guess, at least 100 because you have to go... Um, down to the, the the sound is sort of an inlet. You you'd either have to take a ferry across, and then even then to get to the coast, you have to go around a lot because of mountains, or you just go down to the bottom of the the south end of the sound, where you can drive across. So you know to get it's it's at least 350 miles without mm-hmm. you know having the Google Maps in front of me. And once you get, so for, for those people like you who haven't been, you've been to the Grand Canyon. I know that. But you haven't been much west of the Mississippi. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, and for people like you who haven't been much west of the Mississippi, one thing to realize is that there's, there's a mountain range called the Cascade Mountains in the Pacific Northwest. And there's just a huge difference in weather, depending on whether you're here on the drier and in the summer hotter side and in the winter colder side, or if you're on the side that's got the the ocean influence, where despite being way north of where you are, Seattle hardly ever gets snow and freaks out when it does. (laughs) So (laughs) So that's mainly because of the mountain range. Right. I mean, what, what basically happens is the rain falls. In fact, the, the beginning of the mountains makes a lot of rainfall right on the mountain range. And snow, because, you know, as you go up off, as you gain elevation, you can get snow there. But the places by the coast, um, well, you, I know you go, and various people in the east that are near the ocean go to the ocean. And you probably notice that, like, if you go to Ocean City, right? Right. Right. So in Ocean City, Maryland, this is to, to um, people listening on the Internet. In Ocean City, Maryland, you get a little bit of moderation because you're on the ocean, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, in, on the West Coast, you get a lot 
the difference being that you know how all the weather moves from west to east? The winds up high generally move things from the west over to the east. Mm-hmm. Well, in Ocean City, the the ocean is to the east, so you're getting some moderation just because it's there. But in all the West Coast places, the prevailing winds are off the ocean. So that has a, you know, time five effect of what it has of the moderation you get if you go to Ocean City. I mean, me and my family, we go to Chincoteague a lot, and you'd see some of the same thing. And it's, you know, nothing really compared to that, you know. Sometimes, depending on your luck, even Seattle, in Seattle can be a record. It might depend on whether it just happened to happen on that date or not. Um, and so, you know, the whole West Coast and St. Paul Island, Alaska, it's an island surrounded by cold water. And further north, unless there's been in a, the past few years a higher temperature, and I don't think there has been, the highest temperature ever recorded there is 66. Wow. <laughs> I know. That's pretty impressive. But that's because it's, it's – the coldness is – It's um, I've seen it. I haven't actually been in weather like that there. It's like in the minus 20s or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not so much that it's a freezing cold place. It's that it's surrounded by water. So if you go there and it's surrounded by, by you know, colder water – than you would get, you know, even in Seattle. And so it tends to just be foggy. And the, you know, the whole time I was there, it was probably probably between 45 and 55. And I don't mean for the high. I mean, just like, and then, you know, the sun would go down, but it, it wouldn't make that much of a difference or cool it off that much. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's just, you know, sometimes the sun comes out, but usually it's cloudy. Um, sometimes it's foggy. Um, it was when when the cloud ceiling is too low, um, you you can't fly out of town, which is why I got to Spokane about a day and a half late from when I was supposed to. <laughs> really? Because of the cloud? Yeah. Right. Because that, you, with the low cloud ceiling, that's something where where the even the big planes, but also the small planes, don't necessarily want to fly in on that so mm-hmm. well back here in Maryland it's been uh it's been rain rain and uh pretty much more rain so it's a uh, we this is probably one of the wetter summers we've had uh and uh like my potatoes that I put in the ground I, I, I put a new garden in and it's kind of low but it's still I thought it would, would have drained but my potatoes were actually rotting in the ground it's been so much water so uh this has been a rather wet summer. Wow. Now, is this storms or, like, constant all-day rain or storms little, coming in bit. and out all day or what? A little bit of each. We've had, we, had, we had the typical line of storms that run up the coast that kind of run, you know, east, uh, west to east. We've had the, uh, the kind of like torrential three-hour, four-hour long just rain, rain, rain. We've had the drizzle all day long. It, it's been in and off. And just when you think it's going to clear, it, it'll clear up a little bit, a little sun, and before you know it, we got more rain. So it's uh, you know, and it, it's good for the garden in most respects. It's just that certain crops uh, that, that are in the ground uh, aren't doing too well with it. So, um, But, you know, tomatoes doing good. we got good, good lettuce, good cucumbers. we got pickles in the in the jar. The uh, red wild raspberries came in tremendous and it's so so it's good, but it's just a lot of rain. It's not. I don't think it's making for some people's ideal kind of a summer vacation. Right, right. So it's actually it's being good for what your um, for for your agricultural um, stuff though, mostly except for the yeah, potatoes. Yeah, most, yeah, exactly. Most of it, yes. But except for the potatoes, I think other than that, it's been fine. Kind of tough to get out and cut the grass because sometimes the lower levels get a little swampy, so you have to. You have to kind of let up, but you know, life's tough. You just you just bear with it. So, <laughs> all right. So, so we've now done half a segment, and people know have a pretty good idea what like weather is like in in St. Paul Island, in 
Spokane today. <laughs> um, let's let's get to if we're we're life and stuff. That was some stuff. Let's get to some stuff of more consequence. Um, for for anyone who doesn't know, the Liberty Works Radio Network is um, affiliated with the Save a Patriot Foundation, and one of the um, associate a, a member of the Save a Patriot Foundation had a bit of an issue. Mike, uh, Dr. Harganon, <laughs> we can all call each other yeah. Mike. No one will know who's talking. But uh, <laughs> do you want to give a summary of that? Sure. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, I noticed in a uh, a Carroll County Times news report that a certain Jane Doe was uh, was taken into custody because of a traffic violation. Well, Jane wait, wait, Doe wait. Her name is actually Jane Doe. Yes, yeah, Jane Doe. That's you know. That's well. See, the thing is, is that. She really respects her privacy. She respects her Fourth Amendment to be secure in her person and in her, you know, that kind of thing. And and she takes the Constitution to heart. And she's not one to just kind of give up a Social Security number because she doesn't. She believes that when the Social Security number was was instituted and it was said it was not to be used as a form of authentication, that that's what it meant. So, so she's a pretty hardcore. You know, they make rules for a reason. And unless unless there's a constitutional amendment or in cases you know something that 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 of, of that consequence that she plays by the original rules. So evidently, when they pulled her over for this traffic violation, they asked for some information which she felt like she didn't need to give them because she you know it was a, it was a minor traffic violation. Well, they evidently took her into jail, and they've they've held her. So and they've uh, and they put a, a huge bond on her that I don't think or bail that I don't think they're going to going to even honor unless she gives them uh, her social security number or some kind of official form of identification. Which uh, not to put you on the spot, but when you say huge, do you remember have in front of you what that bail is, or just even the order of magnitude? Are we? Yeah, yeah, I think it was something like five hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it was something that oh, okay. when you hear it, you think, you think, wow, what did she do? Murder somebody? It was like a traffic, uh, like a brake light or something. So, so I really think we had enough listeners and enough we could go and have a free Jane Doe, uh, you know, demonstration down at the courthouse. I mean, it's, you know, so it's a, it's kind of like an interesting topic. And I love people who stand on principles. Uh, you know, I, I myself question if I had the courage to always to kind of like hold my ground. You know. And uh, but some of these people do, and I, I say more power to them. And uh, she's she's going through, I'm sure, some uh, some harassment and some troubles and, and some hardships. But she believes in her rights, and she believes that you know that's. Uh, I'm sure she has good reasons for for not just you know willy nilly giving all the information that they want from, from her. And I, and most people don't realize it, that social security number when it was instituted, was was not to be used as form of identification. So, I mean, they well, they, they do print that, that on, the, on the cards, not to be used yeah, as yeah. form. <laughs> which, you know. To read that, though. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah well, so, you're not only not supposed to read it, but if you do, you're just supposed to be like, yeah, the federal government told me that one thing, but I'm ignoring that thing. I'm doing all the other things the feds tell me to do, but that one thing we're, we're ignoring. <laughs> I guess that's how you're supposed to be about it. <laughs> Yeah, but so that's that's it. That she's a she's a she's well loved uh, amongst uh, some of the patriot community, especially in Carroll County. And she's a she's a she's a pretty she's a she's a go doer, and and she's a, she's an amazing lady. So uh, so everybody. Now, did they for, for clarity? Did they ask for a social security number at a traffic stop? Uh, I think they I think they took her in because she was not. Uh, she was not giving them any information, and uh, and according to the newspaper, she kicked. I think she kicked at the at the at the patrol car window or something. And, and knowing Jane Doe, I, I I don't I'm not sure if that was would be an act. I, I can't see her getting combative. You know, she she's more of a mm-hmm. passive aggressive. I got my constitution and, and leave me alone. So uh but I don't know. All I know is that she is in she as of I heard a couple of days ago she was still in jail. So so we'll see. Okay. Well this is life and stuff with the Dr. Mike. We'll be back in five minutes. And 
Cool Back with Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. I'm Dr. Michael Crone, and I'm talking with Dr. Michael Hargadon. Um, and before we, we went for break, we were talking about um, Jane Doe, not her real name, uh, a woman associated with our, our affiliate organization, Save a Patriot, who was um, arrested for, um, and this is the part I wanted to be really clear on. So she, she refused any identifying information at a traffic stop. Is that basically it? Uh, that's, that, is, that is the way I understand it. Now, now, just for clarity, because um, you're, you're the you know former Constitution Party candidate, and and most of us think that if you get stopped, you got to show the cop, you know, that they can even just randomly, even if they show up for no reason. Sometimes they've asked me who I am, and just for for ease of life, I say, here's here's my ID, here's who I am, and show it to them. Um, is is there a reason why at a traffic stop um, they either do or do not have rights? I mean, are are there is there something in the the Constitution or in other documents that says that you are allowed, you know, to not say what who you are in that situation? Well, I I think it stems back to the Fourth Amendment that you should be securing your person, which means that you you really shouldn't have to surrender any of your personal information unless you violated a law or they have, uh, you know, suspicion that you violated the law. And uh, so I guess I guess whether or not you say uh, having a brake light out is, is a, a sufficient, I mean, you know, whether or not you give them that. I've seen videos where people suggest that you, you pull up if you get stopped at one of these uh, sobriety checkpoints or one of these other ones and you, you give them a piece of paper that has uh, like basic information on it, and you tell them that you're not giving them any more information. And on the video, anyway, it shows them wave them through. So, you know, it, you have to have a certain, I guess, uh, confrontational kind of a, a vibe in you. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, good, I'm glad people. I'm glad there are people who do that would just say, "Hey, look, well, just because you want this and you have a badge and a gun doesn't mean that I have to." Uh, you know, just do what you want. So that's that's the way I see right. it. I don't know all the I don't know all the ins and outs of the law. I'm sure each state has its own variation on what you have to what you have to surrender at a stop. So yeah, I, I don't know to be honest. Like most people, I don't know, and maybe I'm better off that way because then, <laughs> sadly, I just give them whatever they want and then you know don't have a problem. Although. If everyone does that, then pretty soon they know everything about us. <laughs> <laughs> be it's like what academics evil. call a prisoner's dilemma. Um, depending on, depending on, I don't know the constitutionality of the, the question at hand, but I do know that there are plenty of times when cops do attempt some sort of unconstitutional, you know, just random drug search or even the sobriety checkpoints you were talking about, where it's just like, um, you know, they have no reason. If it's just a checkpoint and they're stopping everybody, they have no reason to believe that you're not um, <laughs> that you're not sober. But um, they go ahead and just stop everybody, and you have to do it. And I can understand why if, you know, it's something like, if you're, if not having a brake light is quote violating the law, then, then I suppose I can see the the evidence for it. But not every um, not every you know slight mechanical failure should be violating the law. I mean, part of the issue might be that they've gotten the law so um, picky um, that you know the cops are able to just people for just about anything. Um, I wish I had it in front of me because I was not when, – when we talked about um, discussing this on the radio, I did not think of a related uh, subject, which is the Department of Justice's report on Ferguson, where they investigated the Ferguson police. And, of course, now they want to bring them all out, you know, for having violated the law after, you know, DOJ, in my opinion, hasn't cared all that much before. But – in one of the, the situations, what they talk about is there's some kind of stop, and I don't remember what ended up happening, 
But the entire reason for the stop in the first place is that the windows were overly tinted by um, both city ordinance and state uh, regulations on the tint that you can have in your car windows. And so the DOJ, which, and it's not a sympathetic report to the Ferguson uh, authorities, it says, <laughs> you know, this is a legal initial stop because they were in violation of the law. And you think, man, if the law is going to get that picky in, then, <laughs> you know, they can find anybody in violation of the law. <laughs> of course. And that's why Jane Doe, with Jane Doe, once, once she refused to give them information, then they forced the issue, and uh, I think they end up charging with resisting arrest and doing something else. But I mean, knowing Jane Doe, it was probably because she didn't she didn't voluntarily get out of the car and give them give them her hands to handcuff her. If they had to pull and pull and put her hands behind her, then I'm sure they'd call that resisting arrest because she wasn't you know giving in. So uh, so who knows? Right, right. And to be honest, I I've been in both uh, Carroll County, where this happened a fair amount, in Maryland. And, you know, if you go into Westminster and, you know, the speed limit along Main Street is 25, I mean, you could find almost anybody if there isn't a car in front of them driving 26. And they're in violation of the law. <laughs> <laughs> they are. And I they think are. You're right. that there are some people who like it that way. Huh. You think so, huh? Think yeah. So? I mean, that way they can pick people, they can stop random people on suspicion of something else when they don't really have any reason for suspicion, but they can just be like, oh, well, they were going 34 and a 30. You know, we can pull them over for that. Well, yeah, there's a saying saying that if they want to get you, they'll find a law to charge you with. I mean, that's especially with our right. legal system the way it is. They have so many laws, you know, that... If, when they do want to come and get you, though, there's probably plenty of things that you've done that are against some some rule somewhere. Right. So so fundamentally, you know, this whole thing. Well, oh well, if you're breaking the law, it's your fault. Now it's so easy to break the law. If you're going to be so picky on us to be like broken break like. Yes. So so um, let's go on. We're at about the halfway point of the show, and. In the, and it's now been three weeks, in part because the fog delayed me. We had promised one rerun, and, and our, our loyal listeners got two, which, for which I apologize. <laughs> I was, that was our the, loyal that was, listener? That was the loy, our loyal listener. <laughs> you, have a, you have a name on this listener? <laughs> I don't know. Actually, why, why wasn't um, the listener? I, I have a couple of contact links, either for uh, for me to, to send me an email for past shows and, and for other things. Why don't you look where it says um, uh, Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mikes on the DR Michael Crown website and, and contact me and be like, I'm your loyal listener. We could have a competition. <laughs> that, that, that would be like dr michael m i c h a e l crone dot com. <laughs> click on the click where down where it says contact me for past episodes. Just contact me and say, hey, I'm your loyal listener. <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so if if we can get a contest going, maybe we can get a contest going. Or like, who's been more loyal? <laughs> but but that was actually due to the low clouds when I was in St. Paul Island. Um, due to the due to the weather that we were talking about, I wasn't able to leave on Sunday of last week as I was supposed to and call in and do a show. So we didn't get a show done um, for two weeks in a row. One while I was there. Um, I should point out, not only being an island in the Bering Sea, they actually do have some cell service, but. They um, most of the companies in the lower 48 do not work there, and the the one from the lower 48 that does actually doesn't have very complete coverage in the lower 48. So <laughs> I didn't have the availability to call in and do these shows from over there, which is why you got a rerun for those two weeks. Um, coming back though, on the so since three weeks ago. There's been um, a, a number of Supreme Court rulings, but the one that 
I would say clearly got the most intention was the one where the Supreme Court stated that there's a constitutional right to gay marriage. You heard of that, didn't you, Dr. Harganon? Well, of course I heard of it. Who didn't? I mean, it was uh, – although, you know what, Mike, you say that, but uh, I went to church on Sunday after that ruling, and the priest, the priest who, who preaches against gay marriage, who preaches that everybody in the pews should stand their ground and support, you know, marriage between men and women, didn't say a word about it. And that didn't just happen at my church I was at, but it happened at several churches. It's a typical example of these ministers, these priests, who are just so gun-shy about being politically incorrect and getting labeled as some kind of a bigot because they stand for the Word of God. Now, that, to me, that is just, that's, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter-in-law who's new into the Catholic Church, and she was just so upset because her, her, priest, her priest did the same thing. Just, just kind of ignored the whole issue, and here these people are thrown into this, and and they're asked, you know, for good reason to stand their ground and to hold on to what their moral fiber and their teachings are, and they don't say a word about it when the government attacks their basic, uh, uh, one of the principles of, the, of their faith. It's, it's a shame. Well, it's just, you know, in, in in one sense, I'm the least qualified to comment on the church's role in this. I mean, I am socially liberal. I, if the church were to ask me, it didn't, um, you know, I, I would be like, yeah, gay marriage should be fine, but I'm already out of the church. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a believer. And even if I did believe in some kind of Christianity that was more, um, liberal, you know, in, in these social, I, you know, that basically I'm a social liberal. You know, when it comes to this kind of things that are called moral issues, I call them matters of taste. <laughs> and yet I've already left the church. <laughs> so I don't know what the church gains by not, you know, if it believes, it should believe it. And we can talk about it and we can have a debate about what helps society. But I'm not sure what the church gains. I can, I mean, I wish I could just be like, oh, they're being stupid. But at the same time, I know people who disagree with the church on, you know, gay marriage. I know people who disagree with the church on abortion, and they continue calling themselves Catholic. And I don't really understand the motivation of these people either. I mean, like, well, what do you want to call yourself Catholic? I mean, this is what the Catholic Church says. Uh, maybe I'm missing something in doctrine where you're just saying, no, no, no. You know, the Pope has Catholic doctrine wrong, but I don't even hear that from them. I just hear, you know, I, w- I want to be Catholic, and I want to have my own views anyway. <laughs> and I honestly don't get that. <laughs> right, well, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of that going around. But, but getting back to your one statement about, you know, I mean, marriage is a sacrament. I mean, it's one of the seven sacraments in the church. And it'd be like taking, why don't, we, why don't we make people get a license for confirmation? Or better yet, why don't we redefine bar mitzvah and then have it so that bar mitzvah actually means taking a young boy out and getting him laid, and we'll call that a bar mitzvah. And getting him what? I missed the word you said. <laughs> what are we doing and can't be calling it a bar mitzvah? So it's taking a young man out and getting him laid. So, so, and getting him laid? Along, yeah, yeah, you're late, you know. So, and then why don't we go? Why don't we go ahead and make a? Why don't we make a law that says that you have to recognize that this is bar mitzvah, and if, and if the secular society wants to call it bar mitzvah, don't don't bother us with your with your you know uh, traditional uh, theological rules. You happen you happen to have had a name on it and defined it, and that's what we always thought it was. We're going to redefine it and we're going to shove it down your throat. Well, we're going to have to leave with that for five minutes. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. We'll be back. And we're back with Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. I'm Dr. Michael Crone talking with Dr. Michael Hargadon. How are you, Dr. Hargadon? I'm sitting here in my uh, Emmitsburg home with the fan going around, having a rather, uh, you know, easygoing Wednesday afternoon. Okay. When we left before the break, 
you're basically talking about redefining bar mitzvah. It's like, oh, we take, we do, yeah, I mean, and there were societies that did this as the rites of passage, right? I mean, you said they take the boy out and they get him laid. And there you go. That's huh. the rite of passage. Now he's a man. Huh. And, and we want to call that a bar mitzvah. And yeah, suppose we did. I mean, the funny thing true. is the state has taken on defining marriage. It did that something around 100 years ago. To some people's um, surprise, it hasn't done that forever or even for the history of this country. But it basically started taking that on about 100 years ago. The state has never taken on tracking who's been bar mitzvahed. <laughs> but, but, but why not? I think we should. I think we should. I think should we, a license for confirmation? Let's, let's not forget First Communion. Let's get a license for that, too. And maybe the state should just stay the hell out of licensing sacrament. I mean, you know, in fact, I don't know. I mean, that's that's kind of where I would go with this is that, you know, when the state decided it needed to be the one in charge of being married, the state started to become who people look to. If you get married in a church and you don't tell the state, you know, I would say the typical American will be like, oh, well, that's not really getting married. I've already had the conversation with my wife of 40 years that it would be good to get a civil divorce. And she's agreed. So if we can just find an attorney who knows, who knows how to uh, do a civil divorce and what the, uh, you know, what the customs would be, then we would be seriously interested in talking to them because we're sacramentally married and we'll stay sacramentally married. But if what they're calling marriage is, you know, a man sticking his penis up another man's asshole, and they're going to call that a marriage act, well, then that's not the same marriage act that sacramentally we got into. So when they changed the, the definition of marriage, they, in fact, excluded what we believe to be marriage. I think you could have a gay marriage without conjugating it. I think the government's okay with that. <laughs> Just pointing that out. You know, they haven't really oh, defined right. it, as you said. You can have a gay marriage without conjugating um, by the way, I have heard from someone who is Catholic, got divorced civilly, intending it actually as a real divorce, that the Catholic Church does not, you know, recognize civil divorces anyway. So if you got a civil divorce, I mean, you could check with someone. But as far no, as the Catholic not, Church is saying, concerned, I don't think you're divorced. <laughs> no, you're not. You're still married. That's what I'm saying. So there's nothing right. other than going through the process of the divorce. But I'm not sure what's involved with that as far as, you know, how you end up on the other end of it. So, but. Right. And um, just for people who, who weren't listening to our previous show and, you know, who when I said, oh, I'm socially liberal, like I don't even know what you mean by that. Um, you know, we had a previous show where we were talking to, to a lesbian woman who was pro-life. And it got into somewhat of a debate over that, you know, whether being lesbian was okay. But I want to point out that, you know, as a pro-lifer, I can disagree with you on these things. I mean, basically, it's, it's a, you know, to use like a philosophical term, what they'd call object-level disagreement on whether this is, you know, morally okay. And even a um, disagreement on whether it is, uh, you know, what the government should be doing. And my, my ideal response would be nothing. <laughs> You know, you, we both are Maryland residents, and we both, a few years ago, had the opportunity to vote on whether or not marriage that between the sex couples would be recognized in Maryland. But they never gave the opportunity to vote on whether Maryland would just get out of the marriage business. And to me, that one, <laughs> that, that's just, that wasn't on the ballot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, 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 what? <laughs> It wasn't like, what, what What do you think marriage should be? It should be like, well, should it be something that Maryland is tracking? <laughs> should it be something that people agree to themselves? <laughs> should it be something done in a church? You know, what should it be? Well, I would say <laughs> it's something, you know, in, in the end, even when they do it in a church, it's something that people agree to themselves. Yeah, they they marry themselves. But there has been some yeah. there have been some introspective kind of blogs that basically point point the members of the church and say, Well look, you know, you you used we used to have all these rules but over the years if you notice now we have you know, a lot of churches recognize no fault divorce 
uh, it used to be contraception was an evil. Now it's like perfectly fine. Everybody, you know, I mean, they pretty much have watered down the sacrament themselves to the point that they they weakened it to the point that uh, that why why wouldn't the, the gay and lesbian community just want to jump into it? So it's it's really it's really as much I think uh, the church meaning in the broad sense all Christian churches fought because they've weakened the whole structure of what marriage, the sacrament was. The biggest part of the Supreme Court ruling that bothers me is that what it does is it gives a strong client base for unconstitutional grabs of power on the part of the Supreme Court. Do you know why I'm saying that about this ruling? Go ahead and tell me. One, it's an unconstitutional grab of power. I would like to see the state out of the marriage business. I would like to see the state out of a lot of businesses. I don't want them to operate buses. I think they do better with private busing companies. I don't want them to tell me what sort of taxi or what sort of, you know, Uber or Lyft or ride-sharing service I want to use. I don't want them to tell us any of this stuff. But the Supreme Court has decided that equal protection now means that people who have different tastes, like if the government is running a bus service, right? If, if like the city is running a bus service where you live, and you're like, you know what, I don't like buses. I enjoy trolleys better. I am so uncomfortable on buses. I get car sick. But I can ride on trains and trolleys. So, you know, I want a trolley service. And because they're not recognizing the fact that in my, you know, because – I am, I, you know, obviously hypothetical example because I'm like, uh, you know, got, got, you know, ear, ear issues or something that the way the bus bounces around really messes me up. But, you know, somehow trains and stuff, they're a little more, they don't, they don't have to stop at every light. You know, they can go a little bit more consistently. I don't have as much problem. But in where I, where, you know, in, in my community, they're only doing buses. Well, this is a violation of equal protection. Right? Because now, you know, the people, it, it can even be just a strong taste. You know, sure, I, I, you know, enjoy trains more than buses. That's fine now. Well, if the government is going to do one well, then it's got to do the other. And that's what we've done with marriage. We have the government get itself involved and be like, well, we'll recognize these, this certain class of marriage. Which, by the way, when they first started doing it, part of the point was to be restrictive, according to one of the things that popped up on Facebook. I can't vouch for it, but the first government checking up and licensing marriage was to limit, uh, what's the word for it, misogynation, marriage between races. Right? So, so the government's like, well, we, we want to give you, you know, we'll give you licenses and approve whether you're, you know, marriage is good enough or not. And they approve some of them, but not others. And the court is like, the court is like oh, well, that's not equal protection. Well, if, if the government runs buses and not trains, and some people like trains, why is that not a, you know, some people like buses. They're getting just what they want. Can you go make an equal protection claim that now, you know, oh, well, the train likers are, you know, you're, you're not being fair. <laughs> you need to start having trains. You know, as much as I can't justify it on libertarian grounds, I like the federal lands that they have out west. I enjoy them. But there are people who enjoy shopping malls. Should there be government-run and owned shopping malls for those people just out of equality? You see where I'm going with this. The Supreme Court has decided yeah. that equal protection means it can decide which groups need the equal protection and which don't in the end. Because they're never going to start saying that absolutely everything, like government-run shopping malls, is required if government is going to run anything. And this is the Supreme Court. But don't let your Congress off the loop, because if you listen to our prior shows, we talked about Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, which gives the Congress authority to regulate what the courts rule on and what they don't. So the, so the right. Congress can in, fact, can, in fact, tell the courts, you do not rule on marriage or you do not rule on you know on any particular right. and the congress the congress can add enough justices to the supreme court to water down the ones that are currently there the congress sure. well not the congress so much but the executive can decide that the supreme court rulings 
you know, that are unconstitutional won't be followed. Um, and the executive is a fancy word for basically the president or the heads of other branches, you know, on the federal level. People on the local level can can Governors. decide. Right. Now, now, the other thing that I was saying about this ruling, though, and part of what really bothers me is that the Supreme Court has gotten itself a client because I fear that the the homosexuals in the country and, you know, all the people um, sort of like me who are sympathetic to people who choose to be homosexual, which is a much greater group in terms of numbers than the actual homosexuals themselves, are now going to be very afraid of any of these checks that I just listed and that you were just talking about. Because now they, and so that's what I mean when I say they're clients. They are now the Supreme Court's client. You know, the Supreme Court is doing their work. And if someone goes after the Supreme Court, they're going to be like, hey, I don't want anyone to mess with the Supreme Court. And it's going to make it tougher to um, correct the court on abortion. Well, sounds good to me, buddy. I think uh, I think they're wrong on abortion. I think they're wrong on marriage. In fact, I even think they got the race issue wrong. If, you, if I remember, they had a they had a ruling before Dred Scott where they said that uh, slavery or some some way they were treating slaves was okay. So court has gotten things wrong before. Oh no, Dred Scott was the one that was pro slavery. Okay, I know where they said the Constitution the Constitution. Um, authorized slavery, which is the standard opinion, although I think the framers left themselves open to an argument based on the fact that they kept using euphemisms for slavery in the Constitution. Uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they left themselves open to an argument that it really isn't consistent with the Constitution. In that case, it was, I would say, successfully abolished by the amendment to the Constitution that got rid of slavery. Um, well, not even really by the Emancipation to Proclamation, that. which was just the president saying, hey, we've decided there's no slavery, which I could be sympathetic to because slavery is so important, but is not, you know, a constitutional remedy. But the court had made a ruling that was actually supportive of slavery. Right. It not only said that, I mean, people assumed slavery. No one had questioned, as far as I know, in like a Supreme Court case, whether slavery was legal or not. But it not only was supportive of slavery, it said that Slaves have no rights. Basically, the Dred Scott case, to, to make a long story short, was a slave suing for his freedom on the basis that he had been taken by his master to a free state. So the argument is basically, I was in a free state, then I'm free, and I can never be enslaved again. I can't be taken back home. And the courts basically said... No, you have no rights at all. You can't even sue the court, in addition to other things they put in there. They just said, you know, you're a nobody. You're not a citizen of the United States. <laughs> um, there are. That was overruled by the uh, 13th Amendment. <laughs> um, and that was, and everyone recognized that we were amending the Constitution to make a change in what, you know, except for a few radicals, everyone claimed the Constitution said at that point which is entirely different than a lot of the amendments proposed now, which are just to put the Constitution back from an imperial judiciary. But we're going to have to leave it with that and leave it for another week. <laughs> you have once again educated yourself for another hour. This is Life and Stuff with the Dr. Mike. We air on Mondays from 5 to 6 Eastern Time. Bye, all. <laughs>